Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This evening is the 19th of November, and we would like to welcome Dr. Salvador Ryan, who is going to be the speaker for our second lecture in the present Tipperary People and Places series. His topic tonight is, You May Want to Be a Priest Yet, the portrayal of the Catholic priest in Irish folklore. Again, we would like to welcome Salvador, who is Professor of Ecclesiastical History at St. Patrick's College, Maynooth. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mary, for that very warm welcome. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, to, to uh, come here to the Tipperary Lecture Series and always a, a challenge as well when you're sort of speaking on your, your own home turf, so to speak. In 1937-38, an ambitious project entitled The School Scheme was initiated by the newly founded Irish Folklore Commission under the direction of Seamus O. De Larga and Sean O'Sullivan, Honorary Director and Registrar of the Commission, respectively, in conjunction with the Department of Education. The scheme, which made use of the extensive network of national schools and their teachers, envisaged enlisting the assistance of children of 11 to 14 years of age in collecting local folklore from their parents, grandparents, relatives, and neighbors, and recording it in their copybooks, after which a selection of the material to avoid repetition would be transcribed into official copybooks, which would then be returned to the Folklore Commission for deposition in its archive. To this end, in 1937, the Commission prepared an information booklet, Irish Folklore and Tradition, for teachers, which provided hundreds of sample questions which the pupils might use. And these questions were ranged over 55 topic headings. The foreword to the booklet of instructions deemed the project no less than a work of national importance and remarked that it was fitting that in our primary schools, the senior pupils should be invited to participate in the task of rescuing from oblivion the traditions which, in spite of the vicissitudes of the historic Irish nation, have, century in, century out, been preserved with loving care by their ancestors. So in the period from September 1937 to June 1938, school time that was usually devoted to English composition in English-speaking areas and to Irish composition in Irish-speaking areas would now be reassigned to the business of recording in their copybooks the material that the children had collected. Thereafter, a small number of children would be uh, selected, children that were known for their competence in writing and spelling, and they would be given the task of transferring a selection of this material into the official notebooks provided by the Department of Education. By late January 1939, over 20 tons worth of copybooks had been returned to the Commission. By the close of the project, more than uh, 50,000 children from 5,000 schools in the Irish Free State had contributed to the scheme. And this would result in 1,128 numbered and bound volumes, not counting some 40,000 of the original copybooks of the children. Now, in recent years, as many of you will know, this collection has been digitized. So it is, you know, a local historian's wonderland. You just go into your computer, into www.dukas.ie. You can search by place name. You can search by county. You can search by topic heading, by personal names, and so on. It's, it's, it's a real, uh, real fabulous uh, resource for anyone interested in their own local area. And of course, some of you, I think, uh, may have seen the recent documentary on T.G. Cahar. There were a three-part series on the, uh, the school's collection broadcast over the, uh, the last few weeks. But this evening, I wish to use the folklore collection to look at how priests were portrayed and the stories recounted. This is a small project I'm really only embarking upon, so any findings that I'll share tonight are necessarily preliminary. I, I've already used the collection to explore folk memories of the Great Hunger, the Great Famine in the 1840s, and that's already been published. But what, what, what struck me about the collection <coughs> 
is not, as one might expect, what was left out, but instead what was actually allowed in. Given that these are tales which were told to children between 11 and 14 years of age, and by virtue of their inclusion in the official copy books which were returned to the Commission, it is to be presumed that this material was deemed suitable by their teachers, because as we've already seen, a selection process was employed in the transmission of the raw material to the official copy books. Yet this too is instructive, for in some cases at least, efforts to sanitize the subject matter seem to have been minimal, and one at times finds material that we might today consider quite dark, or even darkly humorous. When it comes to the portrayal of the priest in the collection, one might expect a degree of deference to the clergy to be exhibited in a collection gathered together in the 1930s. And yet, for the most part, this is not the case. Although priests are frequently said to exhibit supernatural powers of both benediction and malediction, much as in the tales of many early Irish saints, including the power to heal. Nevertheless, priests are certainly not always presented in a positive light and sometimes even leave quite a lot to be desired. In cases such as these, one detects something of the usefulness of folk tales as release valves of sorts for pressures or tensions within the community, or indeed avenues through which genuine gripes against clerical behavior could be expressed sometimes also using the device of humor to get one's point across. So what I propose to do this evening is to simply recount some of these tales, which I've gathered into groups under rough themes, which hopefully will make some sense, and see what we can make of them. And of course, I'd be very interested to see some of your own reflections on some of these themes later in the questions. <coughs> I've made a special effort to include material that pertains to County Tipperary, but uh, not exclusively so, for sometimes there's just too good a story to tell from another county. I want to start, I'd like to begin with some of the most iconic portrayals of the priest in Irish folklore. That is the priest during the penal times. Priest with a price on his head, hunted down and risking his life so that his people can have access to the sacraments. In many of these tales, you find the familiar elements of a mass rock, the clandestine celebration of the liturgy, the presence of spies, the sacrifice of the priest by giving over his life, and then finally, some form of supernatural legacy on the landscape and its vegetation, which would serve as a reminder of the event for generations to come. So take, for example, the following account from Riverstown in County Tipperary. And it reads as follows. About a mile from Carrick, there is a bog called Arrick Moor, which was once a secret place for the priest to say mass in the time of the penal laws. All the people were, all the people were beginning to become pagans, and the priests were not allowed to say mass in any church, and they had to go into the bogs and mountains. There are six bushes, and this clump is called the priest's bush. And inside the bushes, there's a large rock which the priest used to stand upon and preach to the people. We can still see the mark of the priest's feet where he used to stand, and the grass is now growing around it. Such impressions on the physical landscape were spoken of in much the same way, as I've said, as those reputedly made by early Irish saints who left imprints on the rocks when they prayed. So this then continued to be regarded as hallowed ground. Another tale from the same area and referencing the same location recounted how in the vicinity of Carrick, there is a mass rock. There's a bush growing above the rock called the priest's bush. This is in the middle of Shara Bog, and it's surrounded by firs and bushes. A remarkable thing happened one year when the bog went on fire. It happened that the fire burned all the heat, and when it came to the firs and bushes, it quenched. This rock was used as an altar during the penal days when the priests were compelled to celebrate mass in the bogs. Because of its association with the priests of penal times and the celebration of mass then, 
Here was a bush that wouldn't burn. Similar stories found elsewhere allow us to appreciate better what's going on here. A story, for instance, from Stack Allen County Mead tells how in a place called Ballon Lock near Kells, soldiers were following a priest and he climbed a ash tree. The soldiers saw the track of his foot on the tree and they caught him and hung him on the tree. Afterwards, some person got a bit of the tree to put in the fire and it wouldn't burn, only get black. The tree is supposed to be there still, and the track of the priest's foot is there on the tree to this day. Now, the detail here that the bit of the ash tree that the priest climbed would not burn in the fire testifies to the sacred status it was understood to have acquired, much in the same way that it was commonly believed, for instance, that holy water could never be boiled. So a divine prohibition against the mundane use of something that was considered sacred. There are mother, many other examples from County Tipperary which speak of this physical impression of the priest on the natural world. From the parish of Killinall, we hear of the following. There's a small school situated about the middle of the village of My Glass in the parish of Killinall in Tipperary. In the years gone by, this school was a church and was surrounded by a wall and some high trees. As years passed by, the wall fell. Then the church was joined with a farm. The farm was owned by a man named John Hackett, who is now dead about 10 or 11 years. This man said that he would cut a tree, so he cut one of the trees that was in the schoolyard. He cut the tree into blocks, and on each block that he cut was a form of a priest saying mass and on each block, the priest was as a different part of the Mass. From Drangan in County Tipperary comes another story of a priest sacrificing his life during the penal days and how the memory of this event was seeped into the landscape. There, uh, the, the report goes, there is a castle in Kiltynan where a priest once hid from the soldiers. He went up to the top of a cliff from where he jumped and got killed. The mark of the priest's blood is still to be seen in a rock, although the water runs continually over it. Of course, it wasn't always those who were thought to be on the side of good who left their mark. Another account from Riverstown School related the following. About three miles from Carrick, there's an estate called Gartine, and on this estate there are many smooth surface stones. Among them there is one which contains the footprints of a man, and above it there stands a large elm tree. Upon this tree there was a priest hung, and dare anyone cut a branch off it. If they do, something will happen to them. While they were hanging the priest, he stood on the stone, and footprints remained, and it can be seen till this day. His horse also jumped against Shinron Catholic Church, and a shoe mark can be seen yet. The man was down on the priests. A story from Kiladangan combines a number of elements regarding the portrayal of priests, but one of the most striking here is that of the priest as Christ figure, as a sort of an, an altar Christus, a, another Christ. On top of Ura Hill is a big rough looking rock on which mass was frequently celebrated in the penal days. The rock is sheltered by an old hawthorn bush which is remarkable because of its very aged ex appearance, and again because it's the first hawthorn in this district to burst into blossom each spring. People say this bush was blessed by God, and hence is referred to as the blessed bush. The record of the priests who celebrated Mass in Ura is difficult to obtain. According to local tradition, of Father Kelly and Father Cleary used the Ura Mass rock for their altars. Father Kelly celebrated Mass in Ura as often as he possibly could, and when he died, he was succeeded by Father Cleary. Father Cleary was not long on his dangerous mission when a traitor appeared on the scene. Big Bill. Now, Big Bill was a bad man. He had spent some time as a British soldier. He found out that Mass was being celebrated occasionally in Ura. So he started for Ura one morning before the priest and his little band of followers congregated to hear Mass. 
Big Bill heard Mass. When the priest turned round to give the last blessing, the people noticed an extraordinary incident. The priest's face became ashen gray. A heart with four scars appeared on the priest's vestment and something like blood oozed forth. The people stared in amazement. When mass was over, the priest went in a sick hall in the confines of Pocan village. Big Bill and some soldiers tracked the priest in a wood. They overtook him and seized him roughly. They tied him to a tree and the soldiers stabbed him to death. The priest, with his last breath, called out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This prayer was said to have been the conversion of Big Bill, for he spent the rest of his life doing penance for the crime he had committed. Also from Kiladain, though, comes evidence that it wasn't always from those who hated the Mass that a priest faced danger. In some instances, it was from people who loved the Mass too much, and so the tale of what we might call today an extremist mass gore goes as follows. Long ago, Protestants and other people who came from foreign countries disliked the mass. Many poor people could not assist at mass. If they were found at mass, they would get a very cruel death. Some Catholics were very particular about being in time for mass. Once a man known as Mr. Carroll, who lived near Kiladirnan Parish, was always in time for Mass. But it happened one Sunday that the priest began Mass before he was in. When he saw this, he got very angry. Then he got a gun. And when the priest turned round to give his sermon, the man was at the door. He shot the priest because he didn't wait until he came to begin Mass. The man that shot that priest fell away from his religion. In a number of stories found in the school's collection, it is actually members of the Protestant community who come to the priest's aid in the time of the penal laws. So for instance, a story collected by Peggy Landy from White Cross in Julianstown in County Mead recalls how at the time of the priest hunting, there lived in the house where the present Miss Drew lives, a Protestant doctor known as Dr. Moore. One day, while standing at his gate, a poor priest passed by with a hunter's hot on his track. The doctor, knowing the condition the priest was in, took pity on him and brought him inside and hid him in the cellar. He went out to the gate again, and about ten minutes afterwards, half a dozen men came riding past on horseback. They asked the doctor, did he see the priest? And the doctor said, yes, but he was gone on. When they were out of sight, the doctor went in and took the priest from his hiding place and told him how he had deceived the hunters. Then he said they must get something to eat, but he had nothing in the house, only meat. And as it was Friday, he believed that their church forbid them to eat meat on that day. The priest says not to trouble about that, and he took a fishing net and went down to the river, which flows at the back of the house, and caught as much fish as would fill a cart. So again, you have this <coughs> portrayal, um, not only the recounting of a story in which, which this Protestant doctor shelters this priest, but then also this portrayal of, of the priest almost as a, priest, uh, as a Christ figure going down, and as Christ did, you know, the, almost the, 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 the fish almost surrender the, themselves en masse uh, to him for the, for the lunch. Now, many stories <coughs> within the collection advert to the importance of the priest arriving in good time to administer the last rites to the dying, and in turn, the various ways in which the devil or his agents attempt to block the priest's path to ensure the dying experience a happy death. The race against time to anoint the dying is captured in the following story collected in Nina. Many years ago, a man living alone in the parish of Ballywilliam was dying. For years, he hadn't been to confession or the sacraments or even to mass. A neighbor who knew this and knew he was in danger of death decided to bring the priest to him. In those days, a horse and saddle was the most convenient way of traveling, and this the neighbor used to get to the priest's house, which was about four miles away. The night was blowing a storm and raining very hard, and although he was thrown off the horse several times, before he reached the priest's house, he persevered. When he got to the house, he had difficulty in waking the priest, 
and it was only when he broke the window that his call was heard. When the priest heard who was ill, he asked the caller to wait, and he'd be back with him. On their way to the dying man's house, they met with many obstacles, blown trees and flooded roads. When they arrived there, there was no light in the house, and the man was dying quickly. With the aid of matches, the priest administered the last rites, and after sprinkling the room with holy water, a flash of light came through the window. This was supposed to be the devil disappearing in a flame of fire in a rage because he failed only by a few minutes to claim the soul of the dying man. Another account, this time from Terry Glass, relates how a priest on a sick call one night had to pass by the churchyard of Terry Glass. He heard a woman's voice, and he paused and he listened. And the woman was singing very sweetly, Colleen Das Crutinamo. The sweetness of the song and the voice so charmed the priest that time passed unnoticed. As the singer finished, the priest bethought himself of his mission and he galloped his horse at full speed. But when he'd reached the house, the sick girl was dead. Now there is a variant on this tale, however, and this following version comes from Kilcolman in County Limerick and it's the one I actually prefer, and you'll see why. <clears throat> it's recounted as follows. One night there was a person dying and the priest was sent for. And when the priest was coming along the road, he heard two people inside the wall singing a song called On Colleen Das Crew to the Mo. It was the grandest singing the priest had ever heard. So he waited until the song was finished. When it was finished, he went over and looked in over the wall. And what did he see? Only that it was two dogs that was after singing the song. The priest journeyed on towards the house where the sick person was living. When he came to the house, the person was dead. The priest said that the two dogs were two devils and that they wanted to delay the priest so that they could get the person's soul. So the priest cursed the song that they were singing. And from that day to this, it is considered wrong to sing it. Now, in the following story from Temple Moor, there are a number of themes which we'll have cause to discuss, and they don't only pertain to the administration of the last rites. <coughs> a father butler of Temple Moor was one day on a journey to attend a dying Catholic outlaw, and he was closely followed by Captain Lloyd and his yeomen. They'd been told of his leaving Temple Moor on the sick call. The outlaw was in hiding in the hills of Bur Burris Snow near the Devil's Bit. And sure of catching the priest, the yeoman took the old road. Father Butler told the messenger who was with him to look back and see if they were being followed. The messenger said that he thought some people on horseback were a distance behind them. As is the priest, these are the yeomen and let them stay where they are. He journeyed on and soon reached his destination. He prepared the dying man and administered the last sacraments and left for home. Accompanied again by the messenger, the priest left for home to Temple Moor, and on the way back, they encountered the people on horseback who were after them on their journey out. That is, Captain Lloyd and his six yeomen on horseback, and they stuck to the ground. When Father Butler was passing them <coughs> by, the captain said, Father Butler, please release us out of this place. Come on, up! says the priest, and immediately the horses moved off. And before they left, said Father Butler to Captain Lloyd, Ah, my man, you got the holy water. Now next day, the captain sent for his foster mother, old Mrs. Hyland of uh, Crana. Now she was delighted to get the call, and she hurried to her friend to see what he needed. When she entered the room, she saw the captain standing near a table on which lay a pistol. He took it in his hand and said, I swear I'll shoot you unless you tell me whether you had me baptized or not. And she says, shoot if you please, but I had you baptized when you were young. The captain stood up, took the old woman in his arms and kissed her. He resigned his captaincy, embraced the religion in which he'd been baptized, entered a monastery and there remained until his death. So, a lot of elements in that particular story. One, of course, is the supposed ability that a priest had uh, the power to stick people to the ground. Now, I remember the first time I heard of that particular tradition. It was 
which was from a very esteemed historian, Monsignor Paddy Corish in Maynooth. And he once told the, the, the following story many years ago uh, to a group of us. He, he said, you know, there was a priest going out on a, on a sick call in the middle of the night and he got on the horse and off he went to, to attend to the sick call. And he got to the house anyway, and I think it was flogging rain at the time, and he got off the horse anyway, and there was a stable boy there, and he gave the, the horse the, uh, to the stable boy. He said, will you ever, he says, hold on to the horse while I go in to, the, to, to attend to the dying man. And the stable boy mustn't have been in much of a good mood at the time, and he says, he says hold on to the horse yourself. I'm not going to do it for you. And the priest turned to him, he says, he says, hold on to that horse, he says, or I'll stick you to the, gro uh, to the ground. He says, if that's the way, he says, why don't you stick the horse to the ground, he says. <laughs> so, of course, this wasn't just a simple story. This was subversive, and it served as a means of keeping the priest in his place by ridiculing his supposed powers. But in any case, back to the subject of the sick call. The sick call could also be used as a source of entrapment for a priest, and many stories circulate about priests during penal times being lured to their deaths under false pretenses. This was a common ploy, for instance, of the notorious Catholic priest hunter in the West, Sean Massagart. Closer to home, though, we have the following story, which comes from Carvely and Ross Gray. One day a message came to a cer certain priest in Ras Gray to go out to Golden Grove. A man was supposed to be very ill out there, and the priest went out, and when he got there, he asked to see the sick man. The people told him the man was getting better and didn't need to see the priest. The priest said he would have to see the man, so he went upstairs, and the man was in a dying condition. The priest aided him, and when he was coming down the stairs again, an army of soldiers was there to kill him. The story goes that a girl of the Vaughans wasn't as bad as the rest of the family, and she protected the priest. She wouldn't let the soldiers put the priest to death. She is supposed to have guarded him out of Golden Grove safely. And then it says, the man only pretended he was ill at first in order to catch the priest. But God made him really ill then to punish him for the wrong he had done. Now, a retelling of that same story uh, from Terry Glass varies in detail and contains a much more graphic description of how that illness manifested itself. And it says, arriving near the house, the priest was captured. He asked to be released as he was on a mission of mercy to attend a sick man. The O's replied that the man wasn't sick but pretending. Come with me to the house and you'll see he's sick, says the priest. It was done, and when the party arrived at the sick man's house, they found him not alone sick but dead, with all sorts of beetles continually coming out of his ears, nose, and mouth. The soldiers feared the priest and let him pass. But not all priests were hailed for their care in anointing the sick. In fact, some priests were actually criticized on account of their lack of attention to this important duty. The following story was collected here in the presentation convent in Thurlis by Josephine O'Gorman from Fina Road. And it says, there was once a priest who was very bad. With this priest lived another priest who was very good. One day the bad priest was passing a man who was dying and the man asked the bad priest for extra unction but he wouldn't give it to him. When the bad priest went back to the house where he was living, he locked all the doors where the good priest couldn't get out to anoint the sick man. But the good priest was inspired that there was a man lying sick by the road, and he got up, and he was going out the door when suddenly all the doors flew open by themselves, and the good priest anointed the man. That was a miracle worked by God. Now, some individuals, however, were clearly prepared to wait almost indefinitely for a priest to anoint them. The following curious story, it must be said, was told by Mrs. Mary Ann Morrissey in Newcastle, uh, who was aged 55 years at the time. <coughs> and it goes as follows. There's a story told about a place called Tuberdoney, where the huntsman saw a fox run in through the briar. They cut away the briars and found a hole they looked in and they saw inside with the fox two old women. There was a priest in the hunt who said he'd find out for himself what was going on. What he did find 
what do, or what did he find but a cozy little kitchen and a nice turf fire and a kettle hanging over it and the two women and they chatting about a sermon they'd heard preached last Sunday. He asked what the priest said at Mass and they told him. And when he went home, he found that the priest they told him of was dead with 300 years. He then went back to the hole and he anointed the two old women and they died off eventually. They had waited all that time for a priest. Now, the importance placed upon the prompt arrival of a priest to the deathbed of a relative can be seen in a story from Dunlavin in Wicklow in which a priest arrives late for a man's passing and is met in the yard by his wife who promptly hits him in the face with a can of buttermilk. Despite the circumstances, to strike a priest was regarded as a serious offence and the story continues with the priest jibing that ye may want a priest yet and it concludes by noting how Ever after, a priest wasn't got in time for one of them in the family. To strike a priest was to invite the vengeance of God on oneself, either sooner or later, as the following story from Kilmurray bears out. Cool the Muck House was formerly owned by wards of Cool the Muck who were of no religion. One day, a priest was walking on the lands which were preserved, and he met young Ward and his brother who were hunting. Ward asked him why he was walking on the lands and if he knew that they were preserved. And the priest told him he was doing no harm in the lands, only saying his prayers. Young Ward told him to get off the land. Whatever answer the priest gave him, young Ward struck him. And the priest told him he might have reason to regret it. One hot day in July, young Ward was sitting under a tree and a, a bough crashed down and seriously in, injured him. He was brought in. <coughs> And he was in such awful agony that he had to be put in what was called the black room, where he died in a day. It took eight men to carry his coffin, and when placed in the hearse, the horses refused to pull. It was said that a clap of thunder shook the house as the coffin was brought out. The room in which he died was ever after full of every kind of vermin you could think of, and the room had to be built in and never opened since. <coughs> Just take a little drop of water for me. I want to move on, though, to <coughs> talk about some other supernatural powers of the priest, and specifically to some examples of these supernatural powers being attributed to the priest, either of benediction or malediction. The first concerns a priest who punishes a man for working on a Sunday. There's a place around one and a half miles from Nina called Loch Orna, and this is how it's got its name. A long time ago, a man sowed corn in a field out there, and the harvest came very bad, and they'd no chance of cutting the corn. One Sunday, it happened to be very fine, and the man said he'd cut the corn, and as they were yet <coughs> cutting it, a priest happened to be on his way to say Mass. He asked them why they were working on a Sunday. The man told him the reason the priest became very angry and told them to leave the field at once. Some of them were just out on the road and more of the men were getting over the wall when all of a sudden a big hole came in the field and water sprang up and covered the whole field and after that every summer when parts of it is dried up the corn is supposed to be seen in stooks as the man had left it. Equally from, from Carbally in Ross Grey the, the, the following story is told. The penal times in Ross Grey and every other place in Ireland were harsh, cruel and unjust. Because of these harsh rules, the people suffered much torment. Those times are gone now, thanks be to God, but we look back at them, not only sadly, but with pride for our ancestors who held to the religion in spite of these rules and have therefore given us good example and shown us what we should do in a time of strife. There's a story told about a descendant of a Cromwellian planter named Vaughan. This man was putting out a tenant for no reason at all, and the priest asked him, asked that the woman be left in her house, but the landlord wouldn't agree. The priest left his hand on the shoulder of the landlord and told him that something worse would trouble him before his death, which would be a very short time. The landlord died in a few weeks, and he was trying to ate his shoulder where the priest had left his hand. Meanwhile, a story from Cadamstown and Kennedy relates how dangerous it was considered to be to defy a priest's instructions. It says, about that time there was a woman teaching 
in a school in Lacaroe. Her name was Mrs. Elliot, and Catholics and Protestants attended her. One day a priest went in and rebuked her for teaching the Protestant Bible. He told her she would die suddenly. One night when she was going to the bedroom, the chimney fell in and killed her immediately. Now, it's interesting that Irish folklore <coughs> often attributes particular powers to the broken priest, the priest who is struggling with one particular addiction or another, oftentimes with alcoholism. And in, uh, for instance, and uh, as in this story from Mulnavat Convent in Kilkenny, which tells how a long time ago a priest lived in Mulnavat and his name was Father Ryan, no relation. He was silent and was very fond of drink. The priest had no means of traveling but by an ass and car getting a few bag of oats from the people. And at that time there was living in Mulnavat a very cruel peeler. And one day while this priest was drinking in a public house, the peeler came in and arrested him. Then he brought him to the barracks. When they entered there, there was a big range fire lighting, and the priest went over to it, lifted up his coat, and sat down on the fire, and it took no effect on him. When the peelers saw this, they opened the door and they put him out. Health and safety, I suppose. <laughs> the peelers never arrested him again. The priest stood up and says, once a priest, a priest forever. But there could also be some gentle mocking of those who believed in the otherworldly power of priests. And this was often communicated through the medium of folklore. A story from County Donegal does precisely this. Many years ago, there lived two old bachelors in a backward part of Ireland. It was the custom the time for the parish priest to go to visit his hearers. And one rainy day, the priest was walking to visit these two old men. When he came in, he put his umbrella on the floor to dry. When the priest spent a considerable time talking, he says, I must go, and one of them conveyed him over the lane. As they were walking away suddenly, the priest exclaimed, I forgot my umbrella, would you mind going back for it? Not at all, says the old man, and he went back for the umbrella. As the man was a long while away, the priest went back to see what was keeping the man. When the priest reached the house, he saw the men taking out the door jams. What are you doing that for? Says the priest. Trying to get out your umbrella, father, says the men. Well, I'll get it out a more simple way, the clergyman said, and he closed the umbrella and he took it out of the house. When one of the men saw what the priest had done, he said to his brother, Begara Paddy, he says, the clergy have the power yet. Other priests, though, were widely regarded as having the powers of healing. From the Pike and Shinron, we hear the following. Um, Father Dan Kendi, who was buried in the Pike Church on April the 1st, 1856, was a very great priest. He was famous for curing people. People afflicted with all kinds of diseases of body and mind were brought to him from all over the country, and he cured them all. It is said he was silenced on account of his cures. After his death, the earth from his grave cured people, and people came in and took it away to cure the afflicted until they were prevented from doing so. And this, I think, neatly brings us on to the final aspect of the portrayal of priests, which I want to cover this evening. And that is tales which recall instances in which priests were outwitted by their interlocutors, or indeed tales which gently but unmistakably mock some of the supposed character traits of the clergy. And uh, one historian, Cara DeLay, talks about that, that in instances such as this, people actually drew upon traditions of orality and traditions of, of, of storytelling in an effort to qualify priestly power. A tale from Castle Comer relates how a tramp managed to illegally get himself a new shirt with the priest's blessing. One evening before confessions, a tramp stole a shirt off the priest's line. Then he went to the priest's door and he told the servant he had a present of a shirt for the priest. The servant said the priest didn't want it, but the tramp insisted that she should tell the priest, and at last she did, but the priest said it was all right, he could keep the shirt. Then the tramp went to confession, and he told the priest that he'd stolen a shirt. And the priest told him he'd have to make restitution, he'd have to give it back. But the tramp told him he tried to give it back, and the owner wouldn't take it. 
So the priest told him, if that was the case, well, then the shirt was his. When the tramp heard this, he went home happy. Now, again, a temporary version of that story it comes from the CBS and Thurlis, in which it was recounted that once a man was passing the priest's garden where the priest was working, he had his, his coat off, left it on the gate. Man took the coat where the priest was not looking. The next time he went to confession, he took the coat with him, gave it to the priest, but the priest wouldn't take it. The man said he had stolen it from a man. I won't forgive your sins until you give back the coat, says the priest. The man says, the man whom I stole it from wouldn't take it. Well, keep it yourself, said the priest. So again, another variation, the same story. You get variations of these tales across the various uh, different counties. Another story, though, hints at the resentment of some that they were not allowed to eat sausages on Fridays. This story comes from the Mercy Convent in Nina. Once a priest was up on the pulpit preaching, and he said that you couldn't eat sausages on a Friday. There was a certain man there who used to bring the priest sticks. When the priest told him to bring some sticks, the man brought him a load of sawdust. And the priest said, sure, that's only sawdust. And the man answered, if sausages is made, well, then so is sawdust timber. <laughs> Other stories, though, reference the priest's often hopeless efforts to catechize his parishioners. One story from County Leitrim goes as follows. There was a boy one time who met a priest, and the priest asked him, could he say the litany? Those were the days. And the boy said, no. The priest said, if you know it in a year, I'll give you a pound. So the boy learned the litany, and he met the priest in t 12 months' time. And the priest asked him to say it, and he said it, and he said it correctly, right down as far as Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. But instead of saying that, the boy said, Sheep of God who takest away the sins of the world. Now, says the priest, you don't know the litany. But the boy answered, What was a lamb last year is a sheep this year. Another story from County Mayo makes a, a, a similar point. Once upon a time, there lived a widow who had one son. When he was 14, the priest got to know that he wasn't going to school, and he paid him a visit. The boy was minding sheep about a mile from the house. The priest found him and told him to bless himself. The boy told him he didn't know how. Then the priest asked him, did he know when our Lord died? And he says, no. So the priest went to his mother's house. And she told them the boy was minding sheep on the roadside. Very well, says the priest. I asked him, did he know when our Lord died? And he said he didn't. Oh, says the woman. She said, well, when did he die? And none of us was at the funeral. She said, we, hadn't get, we didn't get the paper in, since last year. Now, a temporary equivalent of this is found in, a, 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 told in, in a copybook from Marlfield and Clanmel. Long ago, there lived a country girl aged about 13 years. The school she attended was about four or five miles from her home. She could go a shortcut way through the fields today. So when she was about half a mile from the school, she met the parish priest who first, who, who, who first said to her, you're a good girl going to school so early. How far is your home from the school? And she told him the distance. Before leaving her, he said, tell me now, little girl, who died on the cross? And the child, misunderstanding the priest's words, answered, My goodness, Father, I couldn't tell you. I, I, I came by the shortcut today. And in the next story, a priest who offers what he clearly believes to be a helpful piece of spiritual counsel receives an answer he wasn't quite expecting. And it goes as follows. There, there was once a man who used to be seen walking around the towns of Tipperary, so he was called Mickey the Rover. And one day he was walking through the streets of Feathered when a crowd of boys followed. He didn't mind at first, but then he got angry. And the priest was passing at the time, and he said to him, Can't you bear it? Can't you bear it, Mickey? He says, Remember all the patience that Job had. Yes, says Mickey. Patience is all right as, uh, as far as it goes, but Job never had to traipse the streets of Feathered with a wooden leg. Finally, though, if there was one fault of priests that probably got the most airing in Irish folklore, it's the, it, it's the criticism that, that, that priests are full of greed and too fond of money. 
A story from Donovate in Dublin illustrates this to some extent in highlighting the case of a mean and miserly priest. About 65 years ago, there lived a priest named Father Sullivan. This priest was an odd, strange, peculiar sort of a man, and he was a miserly old man also. This priest lived alone. I mean... <laughs> One day, a beggar man came to this priest and he asked for an old hat. The priest was not a very kind-hearted man, so the priest went in and he went upstairs and he brought down an old hat with no top on it. When the priest was offering it to the beggar, the beggar said, sure, what good is that to me with no top on it? The priest says, sure, put some hay in it and it'll keep out the rain, but don't you take any hay from my rick. It's not surprising then and foot of, uh, of stories like that, that the following tale from Julianstown, County Mead, would have been greatly enjoyed. And it goes as follows. It says, one day a priest married two tinkers. There was a man in the locality who was called Paddy the Fiddler. And the priest met Paddy on the road the next morning. He says, well, Paddy, he says, where were you all night? At the wedding, Father, says Paddy. And how much did they give you, said the priest. They gave me a pound, said Paddy. They only give me ten shillings, says the priest. Well, says Paddy, your father made a terrible mistake that he didn't make a fiddler out of you instead of a priest. <laughs> and from Terry Glass, we get the following uh, account. Uh, again, uh, on a sim similar topic of, uh, of uh, the clergy and money. And it goes as follows. Larry Dillon was a wit and a poet who lived in the Pike and Rock Cabin. Many a wordy duel he fought with the parish priest, who also had some of Larry's wit. The most striking couplets of repartee are still remembered by people who heard them from their parents. These few items have been gleaned. On one occasion, when the parish priest was making a church collection and seeing Larry approach, he cried out, Here comes Larry Dillon, going to give the priest a shilling. And Larry, putting some money on the table, replied, You come so often with your call, that soon you won't leave me a penny at all. On another occasion, when the usual Christmas or Easter stations were being held, of course, in people's houses at the time, Larry attended with his neighbors. And the priest was taking up the regular offerings, and he didn't fail to draw out Larry. Now, Larry Dillon, he says, come here with your shilling. And while paying, Larry retorted, although you may deem me low in rank and poor in station, I've never gone to any home without invitation. And of course, this was meant, again, uh, as a rebuke, seeing that the priest, in Larry's eyes, had the ill manners to call out stations for people's homes without their consent. And of course, we, we've, we've, we've uh, accounts of this from the 19th century, for instance, where um, one particular account where uh, uh, it was called out that a station was going to happen in, in this man's house, and he flat out refused uh, that the station to be held in his house. And uh, as a result, it, it said that the, 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 the priest cursed the man and his family, and his, 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 his two, two sons ended up drowned the following year. So again, this idea, this association between when you'd, when you'd stand up to the priest that uh, it wouldn't all go well for you. And this account continues, though, as everyone knows, the custom of holding stations in people's homes was a grand religious one. For days previous to this beautiful event, the family to be visited were unusually busy, scrubbing, washing, scouring, and whitewashing the house from top to bottom, inside and outside. The banatee and the girls were all the time on tiptoe, making sure that the china was spotless, that the knives and spoons got an extra strong rubbing of bath brick, the tablecloth, too, was given special attention that should be as white as the driven snow, but who could make it purer after the hands of the women 50 years ago or more? It was a noted event in the rural homesteads, no less a person than the parish priest sitting down to his breakfast in the little parlours. Then how carefully the fresh loaf was placed near his reverence. Plain country bread was not considered royal enough for God's messenger of love and peace on that holy morning. But the wise pastor valued rightly the substantial homemade bread and pushed aside the intruding loaf. The current of conversation was set in motion when anxious appetites were slightly relieved. 
The priest began it, the man and woman of the house followed, and then practically all the table joined in the pleasant chat. But this concern with money on the part of clergy <coughs> was seen as a long-standing one. And just how long-standing it was can be seen in a popular tale from County Kerry concerning St. Patrick and the conversion of a pagan. And this taps into long-running grievances regarding clerical greed. While Patrick is watching a hurling match, he spots a pagan passing by on the road and proceeds to ask him if he would be baptized. After some time, the old man relents and consents to baptism, after which he immediately dies. Now, of course, this would have been regarded as a happy ending because that's exactly the thing you want to do after your baptism is die immediately so you don't have any bit of a chance to sin and dirty your, blot your copybook. As his soul flew like a bird to heaven, his clothes and bones fell in a heap on the ground along with a big purse of gold and silver. Patrick, satisfied, went on his way, but soon after, he stopped. He thought about it, and he turned back, made his way back to the remains of your man on the ground, the heap of clothes, and he rifled your man's, through your man's pockets, and he took out the, 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 some coins from the man's purse. When our Lord challenged him on this, when he met our Lord back on the road again, and our Lord challenged him on this, St. Patrick admitted that he had taken a little money, essentially a sacramental fee. And this leads our Lord to declare that, and the mind for the money would follow the priests ever after. So variations of this tale often feature St. Peter instead of St. Patrick, but the point remains. To copper fasten this point, <clears throat> the story was often prefaced in the telling in Irish-speaking parts of the country by the following verse. Cahar sagart gan of a santoch, cahar francoch gan of a bui, cahar gracey gan of a bregoch, shin gareg machwil satir. Four priests that aren't greedy, four Frenchmen that aren't tanned, four cobblers that aren't deceitful, those are twelve that do not exist. In significant ways, then, uh, many of the stories that we have just been hearing, in significant ways, these stories were a reaction, I think. Uh, and particularly, again, when we're, when we're in Thurlis tonight, in particularly, I think, a reaction to the new professionalized kind of priesthood that would obtain in the post-1850 era after the Synod of Thurlis, when, in fact, priests were dissuaded from getting too close to their people or too much involved in their affairs and always to sort of stand back and have a healthy sort of distance between themselves and their people. So in, through these stories, by, by, by making priests actually central actors in traditional narratives, laymen and laywomen dragged Ireland's newly professional and disciplined priests into the traditional vernacular realm of storytelling. And this, in a way, I think, to, to moderate the clergy's influence. The Irish Schools Collection is an incredibly rich source of folklore and has yet to be exhaustively mined for the insights it can provide us into the mentality uncovered in, which, in, in what Guy Biner uh, sometimes termed alternative vernacular histories. There's so much work to be done still on this rich repository. And yet even on, on this very topic alone, the portrayal of the figure of the priest, it's just waiting to be written up as part of a much longer and more exhaustive study. Thank you.